Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers and in particular ECOMAS for inviting me to give this uh, talk and uh, well also to, to acknowledge the, the work of the people which is uh, listed below coming from different places and they have all uh, uh, contributed to the work I'm going to present. And there is another comment I would like to do uh, to make before uh, starting is that, uh, as, as the chairman uh, uh, read the title, and the title is uh, Reduce Order Models with and for uh, Goal-Oriented Error Assessment. So the part of and for was mostly based on the doctoral thesis of uh, Frances Verdugo, who uh, very happily won the ECOMAS awards for the best PhD uh, thesis, and he's having a plenary presentation or semi-plenary presentation on Friday. So this part of the title is going to be uh, collected in this uh, talk, which I invite you to, to attend next, uh, next Friday. So uh, I want to thank also the audience, because I am competing with uh, other uh, semi-plenary speakers, which are all very, uh, very qualified, and also because we are competing with the siesta session, which is very attractive as well. So as I... The title was uh, more or less uh, focused on, on error estimation and reduce order modeling, and this is a mixture of, of both. Is that the approach, the recovery approach, is given uh, the easiest way to, uh, uh, to, to explain what is a reduce order model is to come back to the reduced basis, which is probably the, the basic one. And uh, we are very much used to uh, the finite element uh, model in which, uh, or a, a finite element approximation, and I will use Fe to denote finite element. Approximation is a combination of a series of uh, shape functions. There's a big number of shape functions because uh, we have one uh, associated with uh, each of the nodes of uh, our uh, finite element mesh. Uh, the idea is to have a series of uh, offline computed uh, approximations that we will can denote as uh, capital U uh, J, a series which in a number which is much uh, lower than the number of degrees of freedom of, of the actual uh, finite element uh, solution. And we will uh, try to explain the finite element solution as a linear combination of oh, sorry of a linear combination of uh, these uh, previously computed uh, sample solutions so this is the very basic idea and uh, together with this very basic idea we have uh, the concept of a truncation error because uh, since uh, capital m the number of modes in our uh, reduce order model approximation is much lower than the number of degrees of freedom we have truncated the, the solution somehow but we still have the other concept of the error associated with the discretization I, I will insist on that but we have two types of errors the error associated with truncation of the series and the error associated with the discretization which is inside each of the capital U's each of these solutions I'm using to that, that. So these solutions are typically a snapshot and then re-computed uh, in a POD in order to, to uh, take out from the snapshot collection the, the redundant information. 
Another alternative or a kind of a sub case or, 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 or particular case of the uh, reduced order models is the PGD. PGD, uh, and I will discuss uh, particular applications of, of uh, error assessment to PGD today. In the PGD, we introduce a, an additional concept, which is that each of the modes, each of these capital M, a small number of modes, is not an arbitrary finite element solution, but it is, uh, uh, it is computed as a, in, in a separable uh, way. So we assume that each of, of these modes can be computed as a product of functions depending on one of the variables or the parameters, because we treat parameters as, as new variables. Okay? So this is uh, what it is added in the concept of uh, PGD. And in order to uh, compute the PGD solution, of course, we have to enforce this separable approximation. And we have to use a greedy algorithm, which is allowing us to not compute all the modes at one time, but just computing one after the other. So we go to mm, mode number M. And if we wish to increase this uh, resolution, we would add a new mode M plus 1 and inside the, the classical algorithm we are using to do that. Anyway, if, either if we are using standard reduced bases or the, a little bit more sophisticated uh, PGD approach, we have some solution, in this case the one which is in the, in the red square, that we will denote the approximate solution. The approx and uh, I, I will uh, include in the notation the capital H, which is for me the discretization parameter, and the capital M, which is for me the number of modes, so the truncation parameter. And I am interested in assessing the error coming from both the two sources of error, both H and M. So let me illustrate a little bit uh, more what is the uh, idea behind the, the PGD. In the PGD, there is not a single mode for each of the sums of, of the terms of the sum approximating the solution, but each in this case, I'm pointing in my left because I cannot point in my right, but each uh, mode is the product of two uh, sectional modes, since this one is representing the dependence with respect to some parameter. And this here is uh, representing the dependence to the spatial coordinates x and y. It could be even separated in the x and y uh, dependence. Uh, and we will see some examples on that. You can increase the number of parameters. And the, well, this is how the, the you expect to have some convergence. As far as you refine in M, is you increase the number of modes, you get a better solution and you get um, a typical L2 convergence. This is a generalization for more parameters. Which you have three material parameters corresponding to the conductivities in a thermal problem in these three uh, circles. And then you can represent the solution in terms of this uh, three parameters uh, considered as, a, as independent variables, and then x and y together. And again, another possibility could be to split and represent the space dependence as a term of uh, product of x and y uh, functions. Well, this can be extended. And in a recent uh, work, we uh, extended to a context in which this is a thermal problem in which uh, you have uh, many uh, parameters, material parameters. Some other parameters which are telling you which are the boundary conditions on the bottom. And some other parameters which are telling you which is the geometry of the domain. In this case, the, inter the location of the material interfaces. And this is just a snapshot uh, taken from the uh, MATLAB code, which is running this, uh, uh, this code. And the, um, when you, uh, I, I, I didn't dare to, to make an online uh, demonstration. But, uh, so this is just another snapshot. Then you can just 
um, move the bar and change not only the values of the parameters, but also the geometric configuration. For instance, this is a parameter uh, denoting the roundness of this uh, uh, geological uh, formation, the diapir. And also, there is another parameter setting the thickness of a layer of salt, which is this layer here. So you can just move it in your uh, interface, and then it is just re computing the solution as a sum of the modes uh, very quickly and you see the, the solution on your screen in real time. So this is uh, the kind of tools to which we want to make uh, uh, some error assessment. And uh, together with uh, the group of Nantes, in particular with, with Paco Cinesta, we are using this name of uh, computational bademecum to indicate that you have all the solutions for all the possible uh, parameters uh, at hand. Okay. Uh, this is not a well. This is a a, a, a bademecum is something that uh, old engineers are used to. Uh, sometimes it is pretty messy when you see this uh, thing. So I, I I know that you cannot read it. If, if you could read it, you would realize that the text is repeated three times in English, Spanish, and Basque language. And this is because this is a picture taken in the uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. And they used this kind of vademecum to explain something which to me was uh, really not as difficult to explain, which is the life and work of Georges Braque, which is a French painting. So the, the idea is that behind all this display of information, it can be a lot of errors. In particular, in particular uh, we are interested, as I said before, in identifying the errors coming from both the space discretization associated with the finite element mode in which we are computing each of the modes, and then the number of modes. Okay? So the question is, is M too short? Or is H to H the the H the, the uh, element size too large? Huh? And then we want to uh, to answer this question because uh, we know that uh, by drastically reducing the number of degrees of freedom, going from the number of elements or, or, or nodes in your mesh to a much more reduced numbers of, of modes, you may jeopardize the quality accuracy of your numerical solution. Okay, so the idea here, and in contrast with uh, a talk, very interesting talk this morning by uh, Florent Plet in the group of Cachon, on how to obtain error bounds for this kind of approximations. Here the idea, I, I, I will not discuss uh, the possibility of having error bounds. You may have error bounds as well. But uh, the idea is to assess the error very quickly and not computationally costly because we want to use it as a stopping criterion when we want to increase the number of modes. So it's a kind of M adaptivity, but M adaptivity is anything else than a stopping criterion for a kind of uh, iterative uh, incremental uh, scheme in, in, the, in, in the model approximation. And also for age adaptivity. And uh, well, I will just discuss uh, briefly uh, what is the context of error estimation in finite elements, because the, at the end of the day, the tools we are using for uh, reduced order models are not so different as the tools we are uh, using for, uh, for finite elements. Well, the first thing is that, of course, this is the definition of the error. Uh, the error is the exact solution, which we don't know, minus the approximate solution, in which in this case depends on these two parameters, H and M. And then it's very easy to uh, uh, write the error equation, in which uh, in the error equation you have at the right-hand side a term which we call the residual, because it's all we know is in the left-hand side, which is the 
and all, oh, sorry, all we know is in the right hand side, and the remaining part, which is the E, the remaining unknown, is in the left hand side. And this allows us to um, have a, a, a direct error representation in what we call energy norm, which is the norm associated with this uh, bilinear form capital A, which is uh, just uh, the say a scalar product of E and E, or conversely, and this is uh, in which I want to insist, this residual uh, applicated to E. Okay. Of course, nothing of this is known, so just an, uh, an exercise of writing unknown things in a, in a different way. Huh? So uh, these are non-computable quantities as, um, so far. If you are interested not in uh, an error and measure it in, in measure it in, in energy norm, but you are interested in the error evaluated in some quantity of interest and you represent your quantity of interest by a linear functional that uh, we are denoting here by J, uh, then you realize that uh, one of the uh, possibilities of uh, representing the error in the quantity of interest is using uh, an auxiliary adjoint problem in which the j plays the role of the right hand side and then you've got the solution which is this u hat and you have here it in faded because it's well known thing so the, the important thing is that you can use this auxiliary solution the u hat which is the adjoint solution to represent the error in the quantity of interest through uh, an energy product of the error and this, uh, the actual error and, and the error function and, and this uh, auxiliary uh, uh, function you had, or the residual uh, applicated to you had. In the case you have uh, Galerkin orthogonality, which is frequent and it holds in, in, in most of the finite element and, uh, formulations, then you have additional expressions which also work okay but so the three last expressions are only valid if you can guarantee that uh, you have uh, Galerkin orthogonality and all this uh, error estimation business is uh, devoted to find a proper approximation for the error function and here I will use this uh, u star to say this is my approximation of the exact function and I have the version, the sigma version for the fluxes or, or the stresses and then if you look in the, in the bottom of the slide then you have the corresponding approximation of the error because if you have an approximation of the exact function then the corresponding approximation of the error is this E star which is U star minus the approximate U. Okay then uh, there are many uh, works in uh, the long tradition now of, uh, of uh, error estimation. Uh, we are planning to make a, a, a short course on error estimation four year, 40 years on, so it's already 40 years of, of error estimation in, in finite elements now. And there are different approaches to do that, but here I want to highlight two approaches. One is the Recovery techniques, which are the ones uh, very well known as in Kevitzu estimators, the ones in which you take the approximate solution, you post-process it, and then you get a recovered solution, which is the U star or the sigma star. And others which are solving the residual equation locally in different, uh, with different approaches, okay? Uh, you have, you see here more or less the, the, a number of, of uh, references of people uh, working in, in, in with these two approaches. But today, as I said before, I will concentrate in trying to deliver very uh, efficient or cheap uh, estimates for the error in order to perform adaptivity and to uh, from activity both in H and M sense, so, so to, to also to, to realize when the, the sequence is, uh, is fine enough. So then I will concentrate in the recovery techniques. Okay. Uh, 
and this is because I, I want just to, to have it, uh, I, I don't want to have error bounds so far, okay? So the recovery techniques, let me show you, this is a very uh, tutorial thing, but um, recovery techniques is uh, based on the fact that uh, you have your solution, and you can do it in, uh, both in, uh, in the flux or in the direct um, solution. If you do it in flux, this is the standard approach by Zinkevich and Zhu in 87. If you do it in flux, you have your approximate solution here in this uh, orange color. The exact solution, which is unknown, here in blue. And what you do is to approximate, to, to uh, post-process the orange in order to get this red sigma star. And then you measure, or you believe that sigma star is much better than sigma h, uh, the, the finite element approximation. And then you measure, uh, you, you, you rely on the fact that uh, the difference between sigma and sigma h is equal to the, or is approximated by the difference uh, of uh, sigma star and sigma h. You can do the same in, say, displacement in the direct uh, or, the, or the primal uh, uh, variable. Then you have a post-processing of the displacements, but you realize that here, by this post-processing, you get the proper curvature, but you don't get the proper nodal values if the nodal values of the um, approximate solution were not, uh, had some error. So actually, uh, the typical uh, property that you got in the, uh, in the primary recovery is that if you consider this uh, nodal interpolation of the exact solution, which is, again, unknown, uh, the difference between the U star and the approximate solution, UHM, is equal to the difference, or approximately equal to the difference between the exact solution and the nodal interpolation. Okay, so this is, uh, but this is very uh, cheap. I mean, computing either sigma uh, star or uh, u star is, is uh, computationally affordable and without uh, many problems. So uh, this is a comment on, on, on this uh, difference between the, in the primal uh, recovery, you have to take into account that there is an unknown function, U, uh, WH, that is affecting your error estimate in terms of, say, displacement that you don't have under control, okay? So this is uh, the standard uh, idea in recovery estimates. And then the question is, what can you do with that? Because you have an approximation of uh, your uh, error function and the first idea is I have an approximation of the error function, I have a norm, I measure. And this is what I call uh, eta rec by the estimate, the recovery estimate. Okay? The recovery estimate is just the norm of E star. There is an alternative which is plugging this function, this error function, E star into the residual. We saw before that. Uh, these are two equivalent error representations in terms of energy norm. So this is a, a second option. I call it residual estimate. This is a residual of the recovery. But since I'm not in the implicit residual world anymore, I call it residual of the one which is the residual applied to the recovery. So actually, when I look to these equations, uh, my first uh, reaction is saying, OK, I prefer the second. Why? First reason, I am using the equation that I am solving. If I just take the recovery and measure, I don't have any idea on which is the non-verification of the equation. I am just relying in that my actual solution is smooth enough. And the second reason is uh, that uh, I, my error is affected by this uh, WH uh, unknown function. If I have Galerkin orthogonality, the residual is killing it. So it's killing this approximation. So of course this is just happening when I am using the 
primal estimate. So the recovery of the primal variable and not the flux recovery. But uh, the thing is that uh, when I'm using PGD, I need it. Because when I separate in dimensions, and I will uh, show you that uh, in a while, when I separate the dimensions, not everything can be expressed in terms of derivatives. So I, my energy norm is not anymore just a function of the derivatives, and I need to include something representing the, uh, the prime on the displacement. So, so uh, this is a, 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 an analysis of why plugging the error function in the residual works better than just taking the measure, the, the, the energy norm of the, of the uh, error function. And sorry, but I like geometry. So I, I try to illustrate what I am saying by a geometri geometrical explanation. So this uh, line, the black line, represents the error. This is the quantity I don't know. OK? Actually, somebody is giving to me an approximation of the error this recovery estimate of the error, this E star. Okay. The only thing I'm going to uh, assume now is that the difference, this uh, what I call epsilon star, the red thing, has some norm which I express in terms of this constant capital C, which is, say, 10% of the error. So I am making an error in the approximation of the error, which is 10%. For me, in uh, terms of uh, error estimation uh, community, this is an effectivity index of 1.1, okay? Well, so my, I don't know where is my uh, end point of the green uh, bar, but it must be in this circle, because I am assuming that I have an effectivity index, say, of 10%, whatever it is. And then this angle alpha, alpha is telling me where it is. So I don't know where is the angle alpha. Okay. But independently of, 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 on the angle alpha, I can express the recovery estimate in terms of it. And you have this expression. Okay. And because it's just the measure of the green thing. Okay, then you, you do it and it's very easy and you get it. When you do the residual of the recovery, you are doing a kind of projection. And then you get exactly this expression. And geometrically I represent it uh, as a projection. Okay, and this is the blue, the blue part. Okay, when you compare these two expressions, you realize that the effectivity, which is the estimate, divided by the exact, of course you can express it just in terms of C and alpha. And when you compare the discrepancy with one, because the ideal situation is to have effectivity equal to one, then you realize that the approach, the recovery approach, is giving always much worse effectivity than the residual one, for different values of C. And this is, you have alpha in this axis. Okay, in, in abscissa you have alpha. So you realize that it's almost everywhere the double of effectivity if you don't take the residual. So you better take the residual to reduce the effectivity by a factor of two. Okay. Well, when we come back to the reduce order model errors, uh, you realize that uh, has been also explained this morning in, in, in the talk by, by, by Florent Plet. Uh, you can decompose the error in terms of the part coming from the spatial discretization, the part coming from uh, modal approximation, the truncation error. In order to do that, we introduce two solutions, which are, again, non-computable, but which are the finite element solution, and I denote it by uh infinity, because it's, if you take infinity number of modes, 
you recover the finite element solution. Again, this is not computable, but we use it to define, to, to, to split the error into parts. And conversely, we use the U0M, which is the solution in which there is no error associated with the uh, mesh. So you have H equal to zero or H tending to zero. So you have an exact solution with respect to the spatial uh, discretization. But of course, we have an error associated with, with the truncation um, in the terms that we have selected a, a discrete number of modes. Um, then you, you, you may uh, have these two uh, splittings, which uh, evidence the two sources of error. Both are, are possible. And of course, uh, I call the complementary part EM, the error associated with the number of modes, with M, and EH, the number associated with the element size H. So the idea that I want to, to tell you today is that depending on the application, you will use a different error estimate, which is pretty obvious, but uh, not everything works for any in, in all the cases. So the idea is that you have to select, thank you, you have to select a proper U star, depending on what you want to do. Okay? In particular, if you want to assess the error associated with the truncation, with M, then what you have to assume somehow is that the finite element error is negligible. Not exactly. The only thing you have to say is that I look for an approximation which is uh, U star, which is trying to approximate the exact finite element solution. Okay? And then you can just plug it into the residual and get an approximation of the error in terms of energy norm associated with the M. You can do exactly the same with the uh, goal-oriented estimates. If you want to approximate the error in terms of, of the in terms of uh, the error uh, coming from the spatial discretization, then it's the other way around. You have to assume somehow that the uh, the other error is negligible, which is the same as looking into a U star, which is a good approximation of the error in which uh, the mesh is very fine. Okay? And this is, of course, important for H adaptivity. And the other one was important for M adaptivity or to having a stopping criteria. And then I will show three examples. In the three examples, there are three different situations. Huh? All of them very uh, much in the spirit of uh, reduce of the modeling, two of them in the spirit of uh, PGD. So the first one is uh, uh, use of a reduced basis for stochastic modeling. This is a joint work with uh, Eric Florentin that was previously in Cachan and now he's in, in Bourges. Uh, the idea was to compute, to illustrate the, the, the procedure to compute, for instance, this elastic body with uh, random uh, material properties and random not only in, in but not uniform so the, uh, a random field of material properties in which of course in order to uh, get uh, a discrete uh, random or stochastic dimension we use the Kalkunen, Kalkunen law of decomposition and then in that case for the the spatial correlation we got 20 dimensions 20 stochastic dimensions were enough and then we were using Monte Carlo sampling in this 20 dimensional space. And of course, that required a large number of Monte Carlo sampling. Okay? And each one of them was requiring to solve a finite element problem. Okay? So the idea is that this is very expensive, so we'll try to make a, a reduced basis model. And, and this reduced basis we got the idea of building the reduced basing on the fly. And building the reduced basing on the fly mean, meant that uh, for the first computation, for the first uh, Monte Carlo trial, we just compute the finite element solutions. And then we said, well, the first uh, finite element solution is, uh, sorry, now this is, uh, uh, I, I'm not in the right, in the right uh, slide. So this is uh, how we, we, we solve the reduced basis uh, formulation. And 
the corresponding error estimation approach, which is much based on what I just said. And then we proposed a methodology to uh, increase the, as I was saying, to increase the reduced basis on the fly. So we started by the first uh, Monte Carlo trial by computing the full computation, the full finite dimension computation, and taking this unique uh, uh, snapshot as, um, as the only element of the basis. Then we started to compute from i equal to on, and each time we were checking. If we can represent it with the already available basis, then we take the reduced basis approximation. If our error estimator was telling us that this approximation was not accurate enough in terms of our quantity of interest, then we, will, we would compute the full finite element solutions and increase the base. Okay? So that was published uh, in 2012. And this is more or less the final outcome. Depending on the accuracy, and this is uh, here you have the number of Monte Carlo simulations, and here you have the number of elements in your reduced basis. And each one of the curves depends on the prescribed accuracy. When the prescribed accuracy is very low, then you don't need many uh, terms in your uh, reduced basis. As long as you increase the prescribed accuracy, you need more. But the idea is that once you have enough, the thing gets stable, and you don't need to add more terms in order to achieve the prescribed accuracy. A similar approach was used already for the PGD in a, in a work with uh, Paco Chinesta and his work in 2010. And the solution was uh, pretty similar, so we were just uh, uh, taking the dual solution with uh, some uh, extra modes with respect to the, um, to the primal solution. And this was a problem in which we separated the different space dimensions in order to solve, in this case, a three-dimensional problem. And what we observed is that using this uh, error estimate as a stopping criterion was extremely interesting because we were realizing that even if in energy norm you are expecting to reduce the error for each term you are adding to your PGD approximation, in terms of some quantity of interest, you may have zones in which this becomes pretty flat and then you have like jumps. And in some times it even happened that we got worse. Okay, and this is possible because you are minimizing in energy norm and not minimizing in this particular quantity of interest. And just to finalize, let me show you a, sorry, a recent uh, work which is in the same line. Uh, these computations were, were performed by, by Enrique Nadal, apparently not. So they are very uh, fresh results in the sense that uh, they were computed last week. And the idea is to use the same approach to a PGD formulation in which we are separating space and time, but not to decide where to stop the number of modes, but to decide if H, if the spatial discretization is fine enough, and to get a criterion for uh, possible adaptivity, H adaptivity. So the idea is, again, very simple, and, but here we are separating in terms of the two this is a two-dimensional problem, the spatial coordinates plus an additional parameter that we call uh, mu. Okay? And the idea is that, uh, and this is what I, I pointed uh, before, I pointed out before, is that when you realize, uh, when you see the expression of the bilinear form in terms of, uh, uh, in the PGD approximation, then you realize that not only the derivatives with respect to x appear, but also the functions without the derivative. So you need a primal recovery. You need a recovery, say, in displacements and not only in stresses. But you can do everything. We did a very simple uh, space recovery in each of the 
spatial dimensions. We recover the full solution by reconstructing in the same fashion the, the, the PGD approximation. So we got a PGD reconstruction for the, for the recovery of the solution. And we just plug that into the residual as I uh, mentioned before. And the results were uh, pretty nice in the sense that uh, in a problem in which we, we manufactured problem with analytical solution, we were observing effectivities of the order of 1.02 all along a uniform refinement process. A maps of effectivity of uh, uh, errors which are not bad in terms of uh, the projection on the sections and on the axis, which are the only relevant thing here because we want to refine along x and y, not in the plane. And when we apply it to a problem with an analytical solution, we also got uh, results that were very much in agreement with uh, what we expected. And this is all I have to say. Thank you very much.